Welcome everyone to tonight's lecture, which is the inaugural annual lecture of the Institute for Ethics in AI here at Oxford. The Institute has had a rich and stimulating program of events this year, but I hope it's not too invidious to say that tonight's event is the one that I personally have been most looking forward to all year. My name is John Tesulis. I'm the director of the Institute for Ethics in AI, and it's my very great pleasure and privilege to welcome our distinguished lecturer this evening, Professor Josiah Ober. Josiah Ober is the Marcos and Eleni Kunalakis Chair in honor of Konstantin Mitsotakis, Professor of Classics and Political Science at Stanford University. It's also a pleasure to welcome tonight Mrs. Alexandra Mitsotakis, um, who's present. I will not try to recite uh, Professor Ober's many great academic achievements, Suffice to say that he is a formidable multidisciplinary scholar, both one of the world's leading historians of ancient Greece and one of the leading political theorists of our time. As an indication, though, of, of his broad intellectual reach, which he remarkably combines with uh, real administrative competence, Professor Ober has been the chair of both the classics and the political science departments at Stanford. But let me instead say something about one important strand of Josh Ober's thinking, which may help explain why we believe he was the ideal person to be our inaugural lecturer. And apologies to, the, to those who are already familiar with these ideas. There's probably no more important question confronting us today than that of democracy, of what democracy means, why it is of value, and how it can be most effectively realized in contemporary circumstances marked by ideological pluralism, global interdependence, and rapid technological advance. Now, there are, to be sure, also other questions with urgent claims on our collective attention, such as the climate crisis or upholding the most elementary norms of international law. But the problem of democracy is, just, is not just one more serious problem on this list. It has an across-the-board significance because democracy is arguably the most effective and legitimate mechanism for addressing those other urgent problems, whether they be the securing of international peace, human rights, or sustainable development. And yet we know that we are living at a time of growing skepticism about democracy. This disturbing phenomenon plays itself out not only in backsliding in the democratic performance of governments, but also in the loss of confidence in democracy among citizens of established democracies. And it is among the young, those aged 18 to 34, in almost every global region that satisfaction with democracy is in sharpest decline. I can't resist mentioning in this context an intriguing AI-related twist to this phenomenon a recent poll showed that 51% of Europeans would favor replacing at least some of their parliamentarians with artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. sentient or otherwise. Um, Josh Ober is, in my view, our most important living thinker on democracy. His brilliant book, Demopolis, Democracy Before Liberalism and Theory and Practice, was published by Cambridge University Press in 2017. It contains a strikingly novel account of the value of democracy, one that is richly informed by ancient history and by political theory. By appealing to the democracy of ancient Athens, as well as to more general normative considerations, Ober's book makes a powerful case for a conception of what he calls basic democracy that both predates liberalism historically and is independent of liberalism conceptually. There is, Ober believes, an important idea of basic democracy that does not incorporate the characteristic elements of what we have come to regard as political liberalism, such as the full panoply of human rights or a strongly egalitarian principle of distributive justice of the kind defended by the American philosopher John Rawls. Liberal democracy, that combined notion, may be the best political regime type, and I think Josh believes that it is, but liberalism and democracy are, ultimate, are nonetheless importantly distinct values. Yet looking again to the ancient Athenians, Ober argues that democracy in this context is not to be reduced to a crude majoritarianism. On the contrary, it's a form of governance 
that presupposes norms that protect the political equality and liberty of its citizens. Moreover, as ancient Athens illustrates, it's perfectly compatible with a democracy to have established constitutional constraints on public decision making. The key thing, however, is that the application of these constitutional constraints must ultimately be a matter for the citizenry as a whole. In this way, Ober's account of democracy stands opposed to those who today tell us that democratic choice can only be tolerated if it operates within a range of options that have been pre-filtered by experts of one kind or another, such as judges or bureaucrats. For these are the supposedly enlightened souls that preserve us from the irrational urges and nativistic fantasies of the masses. As Josh Ober writes against such views, and now I'm quoting one of my favorite passages of the book, democracy is illusory when citizens are kept in a condition of tutelage such that their votes are limited to choices among options that have been judged risk-free or have been pre-approved by a paternalistic elite." End of quote. Today, in many old democr democratic states, democracy is assailed on two sides. On the one hand, by bureaucrats who want to remove key matters, such as questions of rights or basic economic policy, from the ambit of democratic decision so that they're decided by experts, and on the other hand, by so-called populists who appeal to the will of an exclusionary conception of the real people, a will channeled by an authoritarian strongman as a justification for bypassing genuine democratic deliberation. And of course, technocracy and populism feed off each other in an ever-deepening anti-democratic spiral. Ober's radically participatory conception of democracy with its emphasis on the dignity of democratic citizenship is, I believe, the most promising way out of this impasse. It is an immense contribution by a scholar to our public life. For the Institute, Professor Ober's work is not only exemplary in foregrounding democracy as a political value, since the interaction of democracy with artificial intelligence and digital technologies is indeed one of our major preoccupations. His work also exemplifies the powerful light that multidisciplinary approaches, including in particular the humanistic inquiries of philosophy, classics, and history, the light that these disciplines can shed on the major questions of our time. The title of Professor Ober lecture, Ober's lecture, Ethics in AI with Aristotle, um, you'd be hard pressed to find a more Oxford sounding uh, title for a, for a lecture on AI ethics. The excitement of tonight's lecture is that it promises to bring Josh Ober's rigorous and profound multidisciplinary approach to one of the central questions in the ethics of AI. And that's the question, what should our ethical stance be towards possible future forms of artificial intelligence that equal or surpass humans across a broad range of cognitive capacities? And whereas in the case of democracy, um, Professor Ober looked to the Greeks to inspire democratic renewal in our time, what he finds in Aristotle's writings on natural slavery is a dire warning we need to heed before technological developments outrun our capacity to control them. But I won't spoil um, the plot any further. Please welcome Professor Ober. Well, thank you so much, John, um, for that uh, extraordinary introduction. Um, if I were always introduced um, uh, with that level of understanding, um, forget the praise, just simply someone who understands what you're doing, um, uh, I would uh, have no reason for the sort of complaints that occasionally I make. Um, so, uh, uh, to business. Um, uh, the two most obvious resources for thinking seriously about ethics in artificial intelligence uh, are analytic philosophy and speculative fiction. It would be otiose to discuss the contributions of ethical philosophers um, working on artificial intelligence, AI, for this audience, 
Suffice, suffice it to mention the application of um, trolley problem variants to autonomously driving vehicles, the conceptual possibility of robot rights, and the systematic bias that can emerge in algorithms used for judicial sentencing of con convicted criminals. In the, realm, uh, in the realm of speculative fiction, one can cite Philip K. Dick's 1968 novel, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? adapted by Ridley Scott and released as the film Blade Runner in 1982. It remains, I think, one of the most evocative and memorable films in the genre, although there are many competitors, Her, The Terminator, The Matrix series, and so on. The limits of both analytic philosophy and speculative fiction for ethical reasoning about artificial general intelligence that is the future possibility in which artificial intelligence will have something that is recognizably like human reasoning. So the limits of philosophy and fiction for this are in a sense practical. Thought experiments and fictional worlds require that we project our current intuitions onto imagined situations that are unlike any that any of us have ever actually experienced. For obvious reasons, we cannot run empirical tests of trolley problems with real victims, nor can robots, as yet, demand rights. Equally obviously, speculative fiction remains tautologically fictional and speculative. These practical limits are problematic only if we suppose that actual lived experience actually matters for ethics and that the experience of embodied persons with the relevant phenomena is an important input for ethical reasoning. Now, I recognize that the proposition experience matters for ethics has a history and invites discussion, but for the purposes of this talk, I take the value of experience for ethical reasoning as a premise. Given that premise, the lack of lived human experience with artificial general intelligence, AGI, is a problem, and it's a problem that seems insoluble on the face of it. Until AGI is fully and unquestionably with us, we lack experience or lived experience with it, um, and so we'll be missing what is, by my hypothesis, a key part of the wider problem, of the wider project of ethics in AI. Well, the unexpected and unwelcome consequences of being thrust into a new situation while lacking the ethical resources for properly responding to it is the, pre uh, the premise of much dystopic speculative fiction, including Philip K. Dick's Android novel and its film adaptations. Dystopic speculation posits that by the time we are living in the world of AGI, we will be, as the saying goes, in a world of hurt. Of course, the world of hurt might not come to pass. One could alternatively posit a world of happy in which AGI solves our economic and social problems without confronting us with hard ethical issues. Now, there's no shortage of speculative optimists as well as optimistic speculators in Silicon Valley, where I come from, uh, and it's many offshoots, including here in the UK. But dystopic fiction does point, at the very least, to a meaningful chance that things could go badly wrong. So assuming that we're even marginally risk averse, there are reasons to ask the question, is there a way for us to draw on lived human experience as a complement to the current resources of philosophy and fiction as we try to think more seriously about ethics in AI. Well, my proposal is that we do have that resource in ancient Greek history and the history of Greek philosophy. Now, obviously, I'm not suggesting that there was anything like actual machine intelligence in antiquity, but the ancient Greeks did live with entities that they, or at least some of them, most notably Aristotle, took to be the equivalent of machines with something like, but not identical to, ordinary human reason. I refer to the institution of slavery.
Now, for obvious reasons, I'm hesitant to bring up slavery as anything but an object for the severest moral condemnation. I just want to underline that hesitation. But the issue is already on the table. The conceptual relationship of AGI to the enslaved human is now being actively discussed in the literature. Joanne Bryson has argued that, quote, in the name of her uh, famous article, robots should be slaves. David Gunkel has laid out his reasons for why robots should not be slaves. The ethical issues involved in treating autonomously reasoning machine as slaves has been discussed by any number of others, including, just to mention a few very recent contributions, Kathleen Richardson, Dihal Kanta, and Nick Chisno. Some of the recent literature on historical antecedents to AI, for example, by Adrian Mayer and Kevin Lagrandeur, make reference to Aristotle's problematic treatment of slavery in the politics. On the historical side of the equation, there is a substantial literature by classical philosophers on Aristotle's theory of natural slavery and a large and growing literature on the practice of actual Greek slavery recently and brilliantly surveyed by Sarah Forsdyke. But so far as I'm aware, there is as yet no detailed critical analysis by a writer specifically concerned with AI of Aristotle's attempt to fit slavery into his theory of ethics and politics, or relatedly of the ancient Greek experience on the part of the enslavers, or very importantly, on the part of the enslaved. So that, bringing that into the field of AI is what I propose to begin doing this evening. Now in suggesting that those concerned with ethics in AI might learn something of value from the Greek experience of slavery, I am emphatically not suggesting that we, what we learn is positive in the sense of um, being perhaps helpful for engineers and building better, more effective, less eth ethically problematic AI. I'm not suggesting that it could teach us as ethical agents what our duties and responsibilities actually are in respect to autonomous reasoning machines. Rather, I propose that the Greek experience of slavery is valuable in a monetary sense. It helps to fill out the map of ethical dilemmas we have good reason to expect once AGI is a shared lived reality for us and for reasoning machines. Moreover, a detour into Greek history underlines just how intractable those dilemmas may prove to be once we and AGI are living together. So briefly then, I want to suggest that the long and problematic Greek practical experience with human enslavement and Aristotle's notorious and notoriously failed attempt to adequately, adequately address the ethical and political dilemmas raised by the enslavement of humans can put us on warning. It warns us about ethical problems that we and AGI may confront as reasoning machines move from the realm of speculation to a lived reality that they share with us. At least some of those problems are anticipated in fiction. The difference is that instead of just imagining the possible problems, the Greeks and those they enslaved struggled with those problems day to day, and they failed to solve them. I do not suggest there's anything ennobling in that struggle. A culture that willfully chose to enslave others brought those problems on itself, and it violently imposed those problems on the enslaved. But neither is our own moral revulsion at the spectacle of enslavement a good reason not to ask what we might learn from history. So why the Greeks? Well, most obviously for me, it's the only society and the only philosophical tradition that I am competent to talk about with any level of expertise. But beyond my own limitations as a historian of thought and practice, the Greek experience of enslavement may be especially valuable for three reasons. 
Unlike, for example, the slave society of ancient Rome, we have in ancient Greece the contemporary witness of Aristotle, who was, whatever one thinks about various of his arguments, among the deepest and most influential ethicists in the Western tradition. Aristotle lived among the free and enslaved of Athens, and Aristotle applied himself directly to the question of slavery. Next, unlike the more recent human experience arising from the enslavement of Africans and the brutal transatlantic slave trade, most Greek slaves were not physically identifiable as such. They were indistinguishable from free persons, including from citizens. And finally, ancient, in ancient Greece, enslaved persons were present across a full spectrum of economic, social, and political activities, not only as agricultural or mine laborers or household servants, but also as sex workers, musicians, entertainers, bankers, retail traders, bureaucrats, expert secretaries to state officials, and so on. Slaves and manumitted former slaves were ubiquitous in Athenian life. There was no social domain in which an ancient Athenian free person could be confident in the expectation that no slave is present or that an enslaved person could be sure that he or she would never experience. The conjunction of indistinguishability is that us or is it them and omnipresence, they are here among us always. This conjunction is a prominent issue in speculative fiction concerned with a future in which humans share lives with fully developed AGI. My paper begins with an attempt to reconstruct Aristotle's seemingly chaotic theory of natural slavery. I then turn to the failure of the reconstructed theory to gain purchase on Greek lived experience, including that of Aristotle himself. I briefly consider some ancient Athenian institutions that concerned slaves and the discontent uh, that arose from those institutions or is visible in those institutions. I will conclude with a few thoughts about the motivation of ethical reasoning about ensouled instruments. For the next 45 minutes or so, I suggest that every time I say the word slave or enslaved person, you mentally substitute autonomous reasoning machine. Aristotle's theory of slavery is distinctive in the Greek tradition in that he sought to justify, not merely to assume a belief that enslavement of some humans by others was natural, as opposed to merely jur uh, juridically conventional as a contingent artifact of positive law. Aristotle's theory is moreover distinctive in that his justification was based on explicitly analogizing natural slaves, as he called them, to autonomous and reason-using instruments or machines. He developed his theory in book one of the politics in response to unnamed others, that is, other Greek writers, who had argued that slavery was against nature. According to these writers, even when legally established, the slave-master relationship was, as Aristotle paraphrases them, quote, not according to justice, but by force. Aristotle had his own reasons for seeking to show against these anonymous critics that slavery could be, although it was not always, natural. I'll touch on what I suppose were Aristotle's reasons for developing his theory at the end of this talk. But for present purposes, Aristotle's motives for engaging the question are of less moment than the arguments he developed in favor of the, quote, natural slavery hypothesis. Aristotle begins book one of the politics with a discussion of interdependence among humans and natural, as he imagines them, authority relations in the household. This leads him to, claim, to a claim about mutual advantage. The conjunction of natural ruler and natural subject is, he says, for the sake of preservation. Quote, for he who is capable of foreseeing with his mind 
is naturally a ruler and naturally a master, and he who can do these things, that is, carry out the necessary work with his body, is subject and naturally a slave, so that the master and slave have the same interest. That's a key point. Aristotle's mutual advantage claim is predicated on a cognitive distinction between master and natural slave. The, mas the master is a master by nature insofar as he has the capacity to plan ahead. The slave is a slave by nature because he lacks that capacity and thus is limited to preserving the independent conjunction by bodily exertions. But the difference called out here is not a question of the basic human capacity to understand and use language. There's no question about slaves having um, uh, that capacity. Uh, Aristotle's natural slave is fully capable of speech and at a minimum capable of grasping and carrying out orders in order to do these things. Although Aristotle denied that a slave could experience true happiness, eudaimonia, he recognized that an enslaved person felt pleasures and pains just as vividly as does the model free person. Aristotle next asserts that the complete human household, oikos, that is the natural unit of biological reproduction and material production, is composed not only of husband, wife, and children, but also slaves and free persons. This in turn requires that someone among the free persons of the household has expertise in mastery. As we've seen, other Greek writers had argued that mastery of that kind was unnatural, premised on force rather than on justice. Aristotle's repast to these critics begins with a claim about just possession. So the household, as a natural productive unit, necessarily requires possessions as instruments in order that the productive work be accomplished. Since, according to Aristotle's teleology, nature does nothing in vain, possession of necessary instruments is natural. Aristotle divides these naturally possessed instruments into inanimate and animate, that is literally insold, and psychon, categorizing the slave as the latter sort, an ensouled instrument. That is uh, an ensouled instrument that is a possession, one that belongs wholly to its owner. Deferring for the time further discussion of the question of how possession of an inanimate tool could be just, Aristotle then points out that higher order instruments serve as assistants that in turn employ lower order instruments. So um, uh, uh, the quote here is that, and every assistant is, as it were, a tool that serves for several tools. For if every tool could bring to completion its own work when ordered, or by perceiving what to do in advance, like the statues of Daedalus in the story, or the tripods of Hephaestus, which the poet says, enter unmoved into the divine company. If thus shuttles wove and plectra played liars of themselves, then master craftsmen would have no need of assistance and masters no need of slaves. Here, Aristotle quotes Homer's Iliad, an early Greek work of speculative fiction, he introduces the self-moving creatures of Daedalus and Hephaestus as a thought experiment. Now the experiment posits two kinds of autonomous machines, one capable of completing its own work if and only if given the relevant orders. The other kind of machine is capable of perceiving in advance the work that must be done and then carrying it out. Aristotle's implication is that in the absence of these two imagined machines, the slave, as an ensouled instrument, serves those very same functions. A slave is an instrument that employs subsidiary instruments to carry out its own work, either via direct orders or via anticipation of what is needed. 
but the clear distinction between natural master and natural slave predicated on foresight or its lack in the previous quote seems already to be in trouble. Well, Aristotle then sums up, these considerations therefore make clear the nature of the slave and his essential quality. One who is a human being belonging by nature not to himself but to another is by nature a slave. And a person is a human being belonging to another if being a human, he is an article of property, and an article of property is an instrument for action separable from its owner. These considerations, um, according to Aristotle, then make clear the nature of the slave and his essential quality. I'm sorry, I've gotten one ahead. Um, uh, one who is a human being, belonging by nature not to himself but to another, is by nature a slave. And a person is a human being, belonging to another, if being a person he is an article of property, uh, and an article of property is an instrument of action separable from its owner. Aristotle now circles around to the question of whether such beings actually do exist in the real world, and if so, whether their possession by another is beneficial and just. But we must next consider whether or not anyone exists who is, by nature, of this character, and whether it is advantageous and just for anyone to be a slave, or whether, on the contrary, all slavery is against nature. Aristotle answers his question by reference to the universality of ruling by superior things, over inferior things in nature. This includes when things go right, humans ruling over animals and the soul ruling over the body. Thus, quote, all humans that differ from the model free person as widely as does the soul from the body and as does the human from the lower animals are by nature slaves, for he is by nature a slave who is capable of belonging to another and who shares in reason, logos, as far as to perceive it, but not to possess it. Now, in speaking of the perception of reason, Aristotle uses the same root, aesthesis, that he had employed in describing the perception in advance of the autonomous machines created by mythic Hephaestus. Exactly what it is to perceive, but not possess reason, remains to be seen. After notice, noting a worry to which we'll, re uh, we'll return, that slaves are not contrary to what nature wishes, physically distinguishable from, phys from free persons, Aristotle abandons argument and simply asserts that there are humans who are slaves by nature and that for these persons, slavery is both advantageous and just. Now he readily admits that there are also persons who by nature are free persons, but who through misfortune are enslaved. For example, prisoners taken in unjust wars of aggression. And he allows that unnatural enslavement causes confusion in the natural slave category, but he dismisses the worry with the repeated assertion that the free slave distinction does exist for some and that for them, slavery is just and advantageous. And he goes a step further, asserting that the natural slave is part of the master, indeed an extension of his body, quote, an ensouled and separate part. This leads Aristotle to conclude that the relationship between natural slave and master is not only mutually advantageous, but is also one of friendship, of philia. We'll return to the question of friendship with ensouled instruments shortly. <coughs> Aristotle moves next to the question of whether there's a science, an epi episteme, of mastery and or of slavery. And there could indeed be such a science, he asserts, noting um, that the uh, that the science um, uh, of slavery uh, was exemplified um, by the um, workings of an unnamed man from Syracuse who was paid to teach slaves their duties. Aristotle suggests that this science of slavery could be extended 
to the domains of cooking and such like. The science of mastery would consequently consist of expertise in using slaves employed in complex tasks. Here, Aristotle gestures at a way to fill out his earlier comment on higher and lower order instruments. The slave cook, for example, must carry out a range of complex operations using various inanimate instruments, suppose um, uh, like uh, for example, a, a knife or a, or a stove, and by extension, um, other lower order animate instruments. So suppose, for example, that our slave cook is the head chef in charge of sous chefs and line cooks um, and so on. The science of the use of slaves therefore potentially encompasses a highly complex set of subsidiary activities. It cannot be reduced to ordering at instrument X to perform menial task Y. In chapter 13 of Politics Book One, following a detailed discussion of production, exchange, and wealth accumulation, Aristotle returns to slavery, posing a troubling ethical question. Is there a virtue of character, such as courage or moderation, that is proper to the slave? a virtue that is other than and more honorable than being an instrument and a servant. He acknowledges that the inquiry runs into a dead end, an aporia at this point, and it does so either way. Quote, if the answer is yes, then how is the slave distinguished from the free person? But if no, quote, although they are human, uh, there are human beings and participants in reasons, and uh, participants in reason, it's peculiar, a top on. Noting that similar questions arise concerning women and children, Aristotle digs deeper into the ruled, uh, ruler-ruled dichotomy. If each ruler and ruled can share in fine goodness, kalo kagathia, why should one always rule and the other always be ruled over? Aristotle blocks one explanatory pathway out of this dilemma by claiming that ruling and being ruled differ in kind, not just in degree. Yet still, it would be shocking, it would be thalmaston, if the one possessed virtue and the other did not. He explains why so shocking with a hypothetical question. How, lacking the virtues of moderation and justice, um, would the ruler rule well or conversely, would the ruled be ruled well? Moreover, a licentious and cowardly slave, that is one completely lacking in the virtues of moderation and courage, could perform none of his own duties. So Aristotle must break through the dead end with just brute force. Obviously, both ruler and ruled must share in virtue, but he quickly adds, their virtue must be somehow different. But how different? Aristotle now returns to his psychological theory of the soul and its parts. Every human soul, he asserts, has a reasoning part, this logos, and an unreasoning part, alogos. While both these soul parts are present in all humans, they're present in different ways. The slave, he asserts, entirely lacks the deliberative element, tobolutikon, the deliberate element of the reasoning part of the soul. Likewise then, with the virtues of character, the virtue of the slave, like that of the child, is not, quote, its own as relating to itself, but rather as relating to its assigned end and the person assigning it. The assigner must be the master, the one possessing foresight, the ability to see ahead to the end that the work of the slave will be aimed at promoting. Well, that being the case, the slave, says Aristotle, needs only a small amount of virtue, sufficient to ensure that his work, that is, promoting the assigned end, will not be marred by licentiousness or cowardice, reiterating that the slave is a, quote, partner in living. Aristotle emphasizes the master must be the source of the relevant virtues in the slave and not merely the one who instructs the slave in his duties. Thus he says, 
those, once again, unnamed Greek writers who, quote, deny to the slave um, and say, uh, do, deny reason to the slave and say that slaves must be used by commands that, uh, alone do not argue correctly. Indeed, one must employ rational admonition more for slaves even than for children. Aristotle at this point abruptly draws a line under the entire discussion of slavery, but concerning these matters, let our discussion stand thus. He has, however, left his reader, at least many of his readers, um, uh, with a series of unanswered puzzles, each of which seems relevant to our question here today about the experience of complete humans and autonomous reasoning instruments as potentially partners in living. The central puzzle concerns cognition. What kind of mind does an ensouled instrument possess such that it is at once an effective tool and morally distinguishable from an ensouled complete human being and such that its possession by another and the condition of being permanently ruled over are matters of mutual benefit and justice rather than a law backed by force. Aristotle's key distinction between natural ruler and natural slave is psychological. He's initially claimed that while he perceives reason, the slave does not have it, yet Aristotle then rejected the argument of those who deny reason to the slave and who claim that slaves must be commanded as opposed to being rationally admonished. The slave is an ensouled human instrument and every human soul has a reasoning part which is itself subdivided. It's the deliberative subpart of the reasoning part of the soul that the slave is purported to lack. So for Aristotle, deliberation is an essential aspect of purposeful choice, of prohiresis, and thereby of practical reason, phronesis. He is clear that deliberation does not concern setting or choosing our ends or, or goals, but rather deliberation concerns first discovering the best, that is both the finest and the easiest, method to our proper ends. And then, through a process resembling backward induction, acting accordingly. Aristotelian deliberation is, in Daniel Kahneman's terms, uh, a system two, that is, slow and effortful mental process. Deliberation involves choosing one course of action among available alternatives based on its comparative effectiveness in the behavioral sequence that leads most readily and properly to the right goal. Now back to the science of slavery. The slave clearly has his goal set for him by his master, say for our slave cook, a fine dinner. Having been properly educated in the craft of cooking and having been caused somehow to have the proper, albeit limited virtues, the slave then proceeds through the necessary steps in correctly employing all relevant inanimate and animate tools in order to accomplish the goal. You know, dinner is served. But how does the slave do this in the absence of a deliberative faculty that enables him to make the correct goal-directed choices and act accordingly? Well, in the Nicomachean Ethics, Aristotle specifies that, quote, it is complete virtue that makes the goal, the end, correct, and practical reasoning makes the things promoting the goal correct. So for Aristotle, an excellent individual, one who fully manifests practical reason, has the correct ends in view, and he employs the correct means for the right reasons. That is, he makes the right deliberate choices concerning virtuous action and consequently acts correctly. Indeed, Aristotle usually denies the label deliberate choice, prohiresis, to a motivated action that is not aimed at the right virtuous sort of goal. 
in the right deliberative sort of way. The slave with only limited and derivative virtues of character is missing the capacity to engage in virtuous action by selecting the correct means for the correct reasons. The slave's virtue, we remember, is not its own as related to itself. Well, after asserting that the action, that, the, that it is virtue that makes the deliberate choice among available means correct, Aristotle immediately returns to the, or immediately notes that the actions that are naturally to be done to fulfill the decision are the concern not of virtue, but of another capacity, um, another dunamis. And this other capacity is cleverness, or as I prefer to translate, shrewdness. Um, uh, shrewdness um, is uh, that which is, is such as to be able to do the actions that tend to promote whatever goal is preferred and to discover them. If then the goal is fine, shrewdness is praiseworthy, and if the goal is base, shrewdness is unscrupulousness. This is why both excellent and unscrupulous people, Fronimoy and Panorgoy, are called shrewd persons. So Aristotle now concludes that the practical reason is not shrewdness, although it requires this capacity. So shrewdness is therefore a distinct cognitive capacity, one that does not require a high level of virtue. It plays an essential, if subsidiary and narrowly instrumental role in the overall process of reasoning and acting, ensuring that the virtuous goal that has been identified and the means to the goal that has been chosen by practical reason is pursued efficiently. So in contradistinction to deliberation, shrewdness, which comes into play only after the correct end has been identified and after the general path to the goal has been deliberately chosen, might best be characterized as a sequence of system one, that is fast and intuitive responses. Now in that case, the process of discovery is one of lighting upon rather than effortfully reasoning toward the efficient local means. So Aristotle's ensouled instrument, I posit, while lacking the faculty of deliberation, which requires a level of virtue denied him, does possess reason in the sense of shrewdness. Now exactly how this relates to the lack of foresight or to perceiving but not having reason remains somewhat obscure. But I think we might guess that what Aristotle means is that, the, is that the slave does not possess complete reason or adequate foresight and can, through rational admonition, be taught to employ his native shrewdness to discover and then do the complex sequence of actions that promote the goal along the path that has been chosen by, uh, chosen and pointed out um, by the virtuous master. The master, by stipulation, has completed the necessary deliberative process that aims at the virtuous end by identifying and then rationally choosing the best available option, understood then as the right general means. The local means, um, by which um, the chosen path um, uh, is to be pursued by the slave are left to shrewdness to discover and implement and therefore can be delegated to a well-trained and minim minimally virtuous ensouled instrument. The tensions within Aristotle's account are already evident in his terminology of dead ends shocking conclusions and peculiarity in reference to problems that the theory generates. His elaborate ethical cognitive edifice simply collapses of its own weight when it's put into practice. We see that collapse in Aristotle's attempt to describe a best possible society as well as his own lived, experiment, uh, lived experience of slavery. Strikingly, Aristotle never offers his reader an ancient analog of a Turing test that might allow an observer to distinguish between a natural slave and a complete human. 
He admits that the slave cannot be identified by physical traits and that the slave uses language, feels pleasure and pains, possesses certain virtues, and is capable of complex sequences of means and reasoning. Meanwhile, the justice of slavery depends on the claim that not only the master, but also the slave benefits from the system of enslavement, um, uh, which means that to manumit a natural slave would be willingness, willingly to harm him and therefore to act unjustly. Yet in describing the economic basis of his polis of our prayers in book seven of the politics, Aristotle writes in what manner slaves should be treated and why it is better to hold out freedom as a reward for all slaves, we will speak of later. The promised clarification is not to be found among Aristotle's preserved works. But universally holding out the possibility of manumission must be either an admission that no one can ever be sure that an enslaved person is a natural slave, leading to the risk of false positives, that is, to unjustly enslaved persons. Or the promise of freedom is selfishly aimed only at the master's advantage, at the expense of that of the slave. In any event, the mutual advantage story falls apart. Now, Aristotle's advice to hold out freedom to all slaves acknowledges the desire of all slaves for freedom. And the useful manipulation of that desire by the master, um, that is the desire for freedom by the master, pulls out the rug from under the complacent thought that the master could be friends with the natural <coughs> slave based on their mutual recognition of mutual benefit. Friendship for Aristotle can be quasi-contractual, can be entered into for mutual use. It doesn't have to be based on, uh, on virtuousness. But utility friendship, like all forms of friendship, involves reciprocated goodwill. And it implies a concern for the good of the other. The contract between utility friends must be voluntary and it must be based on a shared recognition of each friend's gain. All that falls into ruin once the premise of mutual advantage is lost. These contradictions are vividly in illustrated by Aristotle's own last will and testament, which has survived both in Greek and Arabic versions. The will is generally understood, in fact, explicitly declared by the, um, one of the experts in the field as without question, wholly authentic. Um, uh, it is um, uh, Aristotle's will that vividly showcases the profound contradictions between theory and lived practice. As um, uh, Anton Kroost um, describes this, um, uh, he's, the, he's the real um, expert on this, points out, quote, under Athenian law, a, uh, a testator could choose to emancipate his slaves in a number of different ways, including outright and unconditional manumission, manumission on the expiration of a certain period of time or after the slave had attained a des uh, designated age, and manumission under the occurrence of a certain event or upon fulfillment of a specified condition. And in the last will and testament, Aristotle makes use of all these possibilities, end quote. Aristotle specifies that certain of his slaves be freed immediately upon his death, others upon maturity, yet others upon the occasion of his daughter's marriage. Some of the freed slaves are to be paid off with benefactions, including slaves of their own. None of these provisions in his will can be accommodated within Aristotle's theory of the mutual advantage and justice of natural slavery. Aristotle's slave, uh, theory of slavery required a category of ensouled instrument, one that would be naturally suited to carrying out the actions necessary to produce the mutual uh, or the material necessities essential to sustaining the highest ends of complete humans. But the theory foundered on the fact that slaves 
did not regard their condition as mutually advantageous. Aristotle's acknowledgement that persons enslaved not by nature cannot be in any sense friends with their owner extends, as we now see, to the entire category of enslaved persons. No doubt Aristotle wanted to be friends with his slaves, um, but in his will he acknowledges that what they wanted was to be free. Aristotle lived in a slave society that was rife with contradictions ari arising from the fact that the ensouled reasoning instruments that were in law possessions were also in practice agents. As agents, slaves were capable of setting their own goals and pursuing them in the face of constraints. Master and slave were participants not only in a system of organized violence and exploitation, but also in a strategic game in which each player had to attend to the moves available to the other. The rules of this game were set by the masters collectively as law, but the masters could not ignore the fact that slaves were agents capable of choosing their own moves, even if the choice was between bad or worse or worst. If the coordination among free men in maintaining the system of slavery were ever to break down, the Greeks knew that their slaves would immediately turn the tables. Plato underscores the antagonism between slaves and their masters and the possibilities of tables turning in a thought experiment meant to illustrate the unhappiness of the tyrant. Plato's Socrates posits in this thought experiment that a man owning 50 or more slaves is transported along with his family to some desert region where he can expect no aid from any other free man. Quote, what and how great would be his fear, do you suppose, lest he and his wife be destroyed by the slaves? And would he not find it necessary to fawn upon some of the slaves and make many promises and manumit them, though nothing would be further from his desire? The answer comes immediately from his interlocutor, he would certainly have to or else perish. So even though the coordination regime among free Greeks largely succeeded in maintaining the slave society, individual slaves could choose to underperform their duties, a choice that is moralized in Aristotle's worry about immoderate licentiousness, or could choose to exit by running away, as we know they frequently did. Run where? In Athens, not necessarily very far, the Athenian state provided a slave refuge of sorts in the temple known as the Theseion, a religious sanctuary in the city center. No slave who got to the Theseion could be retaken by his owner. Rather, a sort of auction was held by which the slave was reassigned to another, at least potentially less brutal master. So the Athenian state here acknowledged the necessity of a kind of stress valve, um, an institution that ignored or ran, ran roughshod over the property rights of individual slave owners while propping up the overall slave system. Like Aristotle, other slave owners faced with underperformance and the loss of their human property through flight used manumission as an incentive. This resulted at the society level of ever increasing indistinguishability and a blurring of status categories. Former slaves were free persons. In rare cases, they became citizens. They were us. The unresolved tensions that arose in the lived experience of shared lives created numerous dead ends, peculiarities, and shocks. The Athenian law forbidding outrage, hubris, that is, behavior that dishonored or otherwise destatused others, specified that, quote, if anyone commits an outrage against anyone, either a child or a woman or a man, whether free or slave, or does anything illegal to any of these people, let any Athenian to whom it is permitted bring a public legal action. Demosthenes, a prosecutor who cited the law, emphasizes in his speech to the jury how humane the law was in protecting even slaves. He hypothetically asks his jury, why is this by the gods that we do something so strange? 
He then cites the ancestral hostility of Greeks towards the barbarians, from whom they now, he says, buy their slaves. He bizarrely imagines those very barbarians having heard about the Athenian outrage law, collectively choosing the Athenian people as their official representatives. Pseudo-Xenophon, the so-called old oligarch um, in a late 5th century text, and Demosthenes' rival, Aeschines, 100 years later, adduce more pra pragmatic motives. The Athenians protect slaves from mistreatment because the slave is indistinguishable from the free citizens. For, so perhaps it was to keep citizens from being outraged um, uh, that the lawgiver protected even slaves, as they explicitly suggest. A similar uncertainty motivates Plato's dialogue, Euthyphro, was it sacrilegious and therefore illegal um, for a um, free man to kill a slave who had murdered another slave? What if your own father um, was the free man killer? What was your ethical or legal duty? Well, in the Euthyphro, it's a famous aporetic um, dialogue. We don't get an answer. Some Athenian slaves could legally enter into certain kinds of commercial contracts. Slave bureaucrats received salaries and had the authority to confiscate without a compensation counterfeit coins from citizens. And yet they remained subject to physical torture if they failed to perform their duties. Slaves could, in principle, offer testimony as witnesses in legal trials, but again, only if first subject to torture. Although Athenian litigants frequently refer to legal challenges or offers to present slaves for torture in trials, we have no clear case of a slave witness actually being tortured. Humanity or property protection or just another dead end? The catalog of dead ends, peculiarities, and shocks that arose within the Greek experience of living with and sold instruments could readily be extended and far beyond Athens but I hope the point has been adequately made. If we imagine AGI as an sold instrument, as having reason and agency, then there is every reason to believe that once we are partners in living with AGI, whenever that happens, we'll bring upon ourselves a host of problems familiar from Greek history. The Greek experience of slavery is certainly not a model for us but it may serve as a warning of a world of confusion, contradiction, and hurt into which we may be moving in the not so distant future. Dystopic speculative fiction has raised issues of indistinguishability, omnipresence, agency, mutuality, friendship, and justice. The lived experience of the Greeks warns us to take those worries very seriously. I conclude with the question of motivation. Why, given the dead ends, shocks, and peculiarities, did Aristotle struggle on at such length to devise a theory of natural slavery? A theory by which, contrary to his own experience, the interests of slaves and masters were congruent and their relationships friendly and just. I think the answer is that Aristotle was committed to a view that a just social order was not only desirable but possible. He so saw no hope of creating a just, that is, non-exploitative social order, one which provided an adequate quantity and quality of material welfare for living well, that is, for free persons to live well, without ensouled instruments. Since he believed that working under another's supervision impeded the development of virtue, yet menial labor was required for the preservation of social welfare, Aristotle theorized instruments that benefited from servitude. He insisted against all he actually knew or must have known about the minds of actual enslaved persons, about the actual relations between slaves and masters. He insisted that ideal type instruments with appropriately defective forms of reason and virtues that were not their own must exist in the phenomenal world. Without such instruments, his polis of our prayers, his best achievable form of human community, remained a fantastic utopia.
a great philosopher's utter failure to square an account of an optimally just society with his own lived experience is a datum that anyone concerned with ethics in AI might want to take on board. Well, is our own march towards the world um, of AGI similarly motivated by a belief that absent the partnership in life of ensouled instruments, we will be unable to achieve or preserve ethically justifiable human welfare? Perhaps so, if one grants the Silicon Valley mantra of making the world better, or perhaps not, if maximizing shareholder value is the actual motivation. I'll not try to answer that question, but I do insist that we should use every resource available to us, including thinking long and hard about the morally repulsive history of slavery as we seek to prepare ourselves for the profound ethical challenges and dilemma of the world that is to come. Thank you. Thank you so much, Josh, for that um, scintillating lecture. There's going to be uh, a panel discussion tomorrow at the Mathematics Institute at 5 o'clock. There will be four experts to discuss Josh's paid lecture, and there'll be some um, intense discussion, so please come to that. The details are available on the Institute's website, but Josh has kindly consented to take some questions now. So if there are some questions that anyone has, please raise your hand, and we've got people with a microphone who will come around. So there's a question here from Milo. Um, is there a microphone that can come down to him? And there's another question down here as well. Hi. So I have a question about the, the methodology. I'm very sympathetic to the idea that certain forms of experience, lived experience, are important or necessary for moral reasoning. Um, but I wonder if looking at the resources of history gives us that, like whether the lived experience of Aristotle transmits to us in the right way. So you could imagine fiction, uh, it's a very sophisticated and large book that tells a story of a place, ancient Greece. They even have this whole language the author has made up with words like phronesis and eudaimonia. And along with this story of what the people did are these texts written by them, the exact things, word for word, that Aristotle wrote. It seems like we could read that story and get a whole lot of the things that you propose, and I think compellingly we might get from reading the real Aristotle. But I'm wondering if anything about the lived experience of what the real Aristotle had does anything additional for us. So what's the difference between reading this fictional Aristotle from the real one? Okay. Pass down the microphone down. Oh, yeah. Peter. Thanks very much. Um, uh, so yeah, the question is, what is the real Aristotle? What is the, the fictional Aristotle? I think Aristotle would probably reject the premise of the question um, and claim that his theory is fully real, um, that it is the product of his mind. Uh, it is um, uh, his best attempt to understand what nature must, in fact, have provided us with. I mean, that's so he's, you know, he really believes this. I mean, he's, a, he's very, of course, serious as a, as a scientist uh, of various sorts, but he's a scientist who believes that nature provides that which um, uh, is necessary to achieve the proper end, especially of humans um, who are the closest thing to gods that run around on the, on, on the earth. So I think he would say that is, that's real. 
Um, uh, and uh, he might indeed say, that's more real than my lived experience. You know, I'm uh, uh, a fleshy person. I do things. There are shortfalls from what you know a, uh, an ideal um, person, based on my own theory, would actually do. Um, uh, you know, would he, if pressed, you know, uh, uh, have some way to justify the, you know treatment of uh, his own slaves in his, in his will. Um, uh, uh, what kind of extended footnote um, uh, uh, might we you know, sort of imagine uh, when he says, um, I'll tell you why it's a good idea to offer manumission to everybody else. Is there, is there a philosophical argument that he might construct? I can't come up with it, but then I admit I'm not Aristotle. Um, uh, so, uh, so I think that's what I would, that, that's what I would say. When we think about um, philosophically, um, uh, when we try to think about um, uh, our own theories um, of uh, ethical theories, um, uh, theories in relationship to our, res our, our responsibilities, our duties to others, and ultimately what our duties might be to AGI at such time as it, as it comes up, um, is that less real? Well, it at least isn't lived experience. Um, and I think the worry is, is we can come up with a nice theory that says it's going to be fine. Um, you know, we're going to have come up with an ethical story um, uh, as Aristotle came up with an ethical story that says this is going to work out OK. Um, how will that be bounced against the actual lived experience day to day of living with these you know, ensouled instruments. Um, uh, and that's what I just want to say, is that that's why reading the philosophy against what we know of the history, Aristotle's history, but then the you know, much deeper and richer um, history that we have of uh, Greek uh, experience of slavery seems to me to be worthwhile. Is this the only, should we just replace all other resources with this? Absolutely not. But I'd like to add this to um, uh, our, as it were, you know, set of tools to try to come up with you know, uh, a better answer um, than we currently have to what, what will we do um, and how will we do it in a way that is justifiable to ourselves. I think it's a, it's a really ingenious and interesting idea to say let, let's look at the witness of people who have lived with insold instruments and see what their lived experience was like and learn from it. But I, I'm wondering whether Aristotle is the best witness here because, as you've explained, his theory is not particularly empirical. It's very much motivated by a desire to justify slavery within a picture where, where nature must have provided uh, appropriate resources. He's theorizing instruments that benefit by servitude in order to fit that theory. So what we get from Aristotle is not observed lived experience. Mm -hmm. We get Aristotelian theory of how it could be justified. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I'm wondering why would we want to learn from Aristotle rather than from other perhaps more objective observers? Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. Uh, the, I take it my answer, uh, at least the, the simple answer, is that um, Aristotle is of some value to us only insofar as we think he is a really serious, very deep, um, important um, uh, ethical philosopher. Um, and if you say, look, Aristotle was a bit of a fool when he did ethics, then there's nothing going on here. Um, uh, but if we accept sort of by hypothesis that um, he's, a, he's a serious thinker about the relevant domain, um, then uh, his failure to come up with a ethical story that manages to in any way capture the empirical experience of his own life and the society around him tells us something pretty important. Um, you know, in this center, there is a attempt, and I think a terribly important attempt, um, to think about ethics in AI. Um, that's what we're trying to do. Um, uh, and certainly we're not captives to various of the premises of Aristotle's philosophy. Nobody is, or probably no one in this room is a teleologist quite as, as Aristotle was. 
Um, but if we say that, um, a great ethical philosopher um, crashed on the reef um, uh, of squaring you know, an attempt to create an ethical story about how this all worked, living within sold instruments and his own experiences, then I think it puts us on warning, and that's really all this lecture is. It puts us on warning about our own struggles and the likelihood of how difficult it is going to be for us to come up with an adequate ethical. Um, uh, I don't think it's impossible. I think we can do it. I just want to say, you know, this is going to be hard. Uh, this, is not, you know, uh, this is not something that we should take lightly. Um, and Oxford University and other places should um, give a lot of money um, uh, and a lot of support <laughs> and a lot of resources to, uh, to centers like this. I'm very serious. I mean, because I think really this is as important uh, it is to you know, underline it um, than per John's introduction. This is you know, on the level of importance of getting democracy right. And since I've devoted much of my scholarly career to thinking about getting democracy right, for me to say that is to um, underline it as, uh, as, as strongly as I possibly can. Yes, we want even more money, Josh. You're absolutely right. <laughs> One last question. Hi, Josh, that was um, amazing. Um, I was really interested in what you said about manumission in terms of like incentives and injustice. But, and maybe I just missed this, but I was wondering if you could say a little more about what it means for the cognitive distinction between the natural slave and the, and the natural master. Is it something like, for Aristotle, the convention of manumission only works when it correctly maps some kind of rational development of the natural slave? Um, is it that the, the natural slave has some kind of potentiality and if so, what kind of this, this sort of this kind of category of the manumitted slave? What does that mean in your analogy um, between AGI and um, the enslaved soul? Yes, thanks. That's great. Um, uh, Aristotle never tells us whether the natural slave can, in a sense grow out of the condition of being an ensouled instrument and grow into being a fully rational person capable of um, uh, phronesis, um, you know, the, uh, uh, making decisions that are truly all the way down properly deliberative. Um, uh, so we don't know the answer to that. Um, uh, this is why I think the will comes in but it's such a deadly um, uh, bit of evidence, is that however we imagine the possibility, it just can't be that the people that he is um, uh, manumitting just happened, this one, to hit that um, uh, level of um, breaking free, you know, graduation day of, you know, now you have the right kind, of, you don't need direction anymore, you're capable, in fact, you'll flourish best without this kind of direction um, on the day of my sister's marriage. Um, uh, or, you know, the other various ways in which he um, decides that there's some trigger um, that, uh, I mean, his own death uh, is triggering um, uh, these manumissions. So, yeah, he may have imagined this, and that's one way to think about it, but it sure doesn't fit with um, uh, how he actually behaved towards, uh, towards his own slaves. Um, so I think that is a, it's a worthwhile question. Is there a way in which we might imagine um, insold instruments um, starting out, in a sense, in this sort of condition of tutelage somehow, in which their best end is, you know, giving, um, or their best, their best condition of existence is being given an end and also given the general path towards that end, and then over time they develop the, you know, what Aristotle would call the relevant virtues, such that they could then be fully manumitted, indeed, um, uh, perhaps naturalized as citizens, um, uh, and then they could be fully of us. That's something seriously to think about. Um, uh, but then, once again, will we, in our own lived experience, come up with these kind of you know, fudges that says, well, of course, yeah, they do want to be free. Gosh, we're not absolutely sure they're going to be that badly off if freed, and you know, it does get them working harder, and uh, uh, you know, makes me a little um, feel better about my relationship with them. I mean, once again, I think what I'm warning against is there's going to be a lot of stories we're going to want to tell ourselves about AGI, um, uh, and that these stories may be the kind of self-serving stories that it seems as Aristotle almost must have told himself.
Can I thank everyone for foregoing the California style or Athenian style sunshine to be at this lecture. Um, remember there's going to be the, the panel discussion tomorrow. You're all very welcome to that. But can we conclude by again thanking Josh for his lecture. Thank you very much.